Hello. Welcome to Play Club, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee Williams. I'm Rick Dildine, Artistic Director at ASF. It's my pleasure to welcome our panelists. Chase Bryngardner is a professor of theater and chair of the theater program at Auburn University. He is incredibly well-versed in Southern literature. Chase, we're so glad to have you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. And Topher Payne is a playwright and screenwriter. His plays have been performed all across the country. And he's a writer for the Hallmark Channel, so you may have seen one of his movies. The Southerner of Southerners, Topher Payne. Glad you're here. <laughs> hey, Rick. It's good to be with y'all. Enjoy. How did you first hear of Tennessee Williams? I, it's more like I can't think of a time in which I haven't known about Tennessee Williams. I mean, I feel like I was, uh, the, the time I guess that I best became kind of aware of, of the Tennessee Williams-ness of Tennessee Williams was in actually kind of late. I don't remember reading Tennessee Williams in high school. I remember coming to it in college. Um, I went to Davidson College in North Carolina. And I remember as a theater major there, really tapping into Tennessee Williams as the only playwright that I could find who actually kind of knew what it meant to live in the South. Um, and mm. kind of in the fullness of that, there was something about the text that just sort of spoke to me about atmosphere, about environment, that just had a lived in bodily knowledge of what it meant to be having grown up in the South. So how about yourself? Yeah. It's it, yeah, it's so sweaty and tasty and yeah, and feels like summer in Mississippi. Um, I grew up in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, which is right outside of Columbus. And uh, you've got to go to Columbus if you if, at, at that time wanted to go to Sam's Club. And um, and so I always passed the Tennessee Williams birthplace. And mm. that was how I found out playwrights existed. Um, and for the first few years of my interest, um, I understood that Tennessee Williams and Beth Henley were playwrights from Mississippi. One was dead, the other was alive. And as far as I knew, those were the only two. And they were my introduction to the craft of writing plays. And um, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in particular, which I read way before I could understand the content of it, <laughs> sure. which then became um, what I discovered now for the last 30 years is still a process of discovery every time I revisit a Tennessee Williams work, mm -hmm. um, where I come back to it and go, oh, you know, and um, it's the reason I seek out the opportunity to direct it, just so I can hang out with it a little more intimately, you know? And sure. um, because, man, they hold up on revisiting. For sure. There's not really a lot of wrong answers in what you take away from a Tennessee Williams show. Um, he thought of his audience very intimately and, and you feel that fervent desire to communicate with the listener. Um, or with the viewer. And um, and I think that's born legitimately out of a Southern storytelling tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought I would start us off just a little bit by just sort of giving some overview and some context of some of his work. And that sort of helps set us up for our conversation and a little bit around, specifically around Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So I wanted to just start off a little with a little bit of historical context. This is the, the challenge of uh, you know, you, you have a, a panelist here who was both a theater and a history major. So one of the things also that fascinates me about Tennessee Williams is the very specifics of the time in which he starts to write and the, the South that he writes in at the beginning and sort of what that set up for him in terms of his um, his own sort of um, upbringing and his, his that shaped him as a playwright, really. Um, so in the years following World War II, the South was quickly transformed from a predominantly agricultural society to an urban and industrialized culture. In 1945, an unparalleled economic boom began as the war industries of the South were converted for peacetime manufacturing and discriminatory rail rates that favored industry in the North were abolished. Between 1939 and 1972, the number of workers engaged in manufacturing in the South increased by 215%, almost twice the national rate while the value of Southern products grew from 13% to 22% of the national total. 
Now you might be asking why this is important. Well, I think this is important because the formal, the formerly stable sort of demographics of the region were severely disrupted by vast numbers of workers migrating from the country to the city. Many black people left the region altogether and what had been a very rigid hierarchical culture where everybody kind of knew where they were and knew what was what was replaced by a much more flexible sort of mobile operating system of social classes that worked better within the sort of new industry and capitalism that was sort of taking root. What Tennessee Williams is sort of on record as having called uh, a quote, society based on money, end quote. Not that the society before hadn't been. Uh, but so a lot of what had been stable was sort of disrupted. And I think when you look at a lot of his plays, you see a lot of people who can't stand the present moment that they're in. Right. You have a lot of characters who are clinging to some sort of past. Right. Think Blanche and Streetcar. Oh, that time when I did that thing and it was so wonderful and awesome and it was so great. Or they're really trying to throw themselves headlong into a future. Right. Think about Maggie in Counter Haunted Roof. And what she's trying to do is kind of carve out a space that's not where she is presently. To be in the present is to be in a in a not so great space. Um, if we could forward to the next image there. Um, so as we talked about before, right, one of the big things, and I just, there are so many amazing photographs of Tennessee Williams at his various writing desks that I had to bring a number of these in. Um, I, I think this picture speaks 10,000 words. Um, oh my beautiful. God, I love that. I want a frame. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. Um, so we talked about a little bit about that sort of knowing the South. And I think one of the ways that Tennessee Williams really puts that into the plays is, and you feel these plays is through that sort of the use of the climate, the temperature, right? It's, it's a character in these plays, right? People act the way they do in these plays because of the temperature. People are either really easy to temper and to get upset as like on a really, really hot day when you get short tempered because of the heat, or you kind of let yourself go into the heat and kind of get slow and you relax into it. And it's kind of like, you know, the pace is either really slow or really hot, right? And the temperature and the climate is a big factor in that as well. Uh, we can advance to the next one there. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting about the work of Tennessee Williams, yet another writing desk, this one I think is uh, the Key Largo office, um, <laughs> hence the bare feet, um, is that a lot of these plays are also structured around what some literary critics have called a guilty secret. And I think this speaks to why people like to go back to his plays and why particularly playwrights are very invested in the work of Tennessee Williams, why actors are, is because these are plays that are sort of set up with a mystery almost as part of them. There's something that's introduced at the beginning that's some sort of big question, right? In Cat, it's who is Skipper? Why do they keep talking about Skipper? What's the deal with Skipper, right? In Streetcar, it's why is Blanche here in New Orleans? Everyone keeps kind of talking around it, but nobody's saying the thing, right? Um, and these secrets are kind of what pull the audience in and you want to know. You want to know that secret. Everybody seems to keep talking around it, right? You want to know what that thing is. And usually it results in some sort of big moment towards the end of the play where there's a big reveal, right? There's a big moment, big dramatic time in which all of that stuff gets put out there. Um, and it really, again, I think goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Topher, about Tennessee Williams really being connected into his audiences and kind of knowing what his audiences wanted, right? And sort of knowing that he was going to set this thing up to be able to deliver and that the audience was going to love that moment when that reveal happens, right? They're going to buy into it and then be really excited by that reveal. So I think it's really important to note about um, Tennessee Williams here is that he really was a playwright who put a lot of his own life experience into the work that he wrote, right? I mean, we talked about sort of his own Southern upbringing. I mean, he, he, you know, you can sort of look across his own life and see the ways in which he really put a lot of his own um, family, his own members of his own family, members of his sort of his past into his plays. You know, he was surrounded by very dramatic Southern women, like he includes within these pieces, right? He, his own sister um, had a lobotomy, which he works in very specifically in suddenly last summer, right? So there's a very direct connection between himself and what he writes. And I think as an audience member, that also gives you a kind of connection, right? He was a very popular playwright, as we mentioned before, which also meant that he, at the time he was writing, was also an incredibly, a big personality, right? You, yeah. you wanted to know what he was saying and all the kind of like interviews that he gives and all of this stuff uh, because he was such a larger than life character outside of his persona just as a, as a playwright. I wanted to, to put some of Tennessee Williams' own sort of uh, words about his writing practice into the, the space here uh, before we moved in to specifically talk about Cat. So I went back to a 1981 interview that was done in the Paris Review with Tennessee Williams. This is much later in his, in his career. 
and he was sort of asked a number of questions to sort of reflect on his, his past process. So a couple quotations here for you. So quote, when I write, I don't aim to shock people and I'm surprised when I do, but I don't think anything that occurs in life should be omitted from art, though the artist should present it in a fashion that is artistic and not ugly. I let out the truth and sometimes the truth is shocking, end quote. Later on, when asked what advice he would give to young playwrights, Williams was quoted as saying, uh, and I quote, what you shouldn't do if you're a young playwright, don't bore the audience, exclamation point. I mean, even if you have to resort to totally arbitrary killing on stage or pointless gunfire, at least it'll catch their attention and keep them awake. Just keep the thing going any way you can, end quote which I think is so, it's such a fascinating thing. And it makes me think when I think of Tennessee Williams plays, I always think of a big moments, big mm -hmm. dramatic moments, right? And I just wanted to kind of end with um, his sort of him commenting on his own legacy here. Uh, and that was, uh, and I quote here, I want to go on talking to you as freely and intimately about what we live and die for as if I knew you better than anyone else whom you know, end quote. And I think that just really speaks to the characters that he puts, that he writes in these plays. These are people that we feel like by the time we finish reading these plays that we know. These are complicated, complex people whose motives are not all pure, they're not all bad, right? And we get invested and we get invested quickly. And these become characters that live on with us well beyond our reading of the play or of our seeing the play. So those were just a few thoughts to kind of get us started off for some larger context before so for sort of jumping into Cat specifically and some of those uh, the famous productions of the play. Yeah, and that's yeah. Chase brought up such an interesting point of remembering the era of when someone could be a famous playwright, um, and and we have that now with Lin Manuel Miranda, um, who is a household name that even like teenagers know this living playwright who is still generating work. At the time, Tennessee Williams was that kind of household name. Mm -hmm. um, and his successes were mind boggling. Um, and he was just going leaps and bounds of, uh, beyond any of his contemporary peers from Glass Menagerie forward. And then Camino Real happened. Um, and Tennessee got his first big time flop. Um, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof was his follow up. And so he was in a curious point professionally as well to have had a major, major Broadway failure at the same time that the movie of Streetcar Named Desire had come out in cinemas and huge success, you know, Marlon Brando becomes Marlon Brando from that. And um, so he has this huge success with something he no longer has involvement with. And in his purest art form, audiences had rejected his work wholesale for the first time. Um, and so this is the sense of urgency and desperation with which Tennessee Williams begins writing Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, and the first voices that came to him in that process were Brick and Maggie. And as he continued to explore, he realized he was writing a piece about the uneasy alliance of marriage. Mm. And we see that in Big Daddy and Big Mama. We see that, of course, in um, Brick and Maggie, and as well as Brother Man and Sister Woman, um, who I always think get shafted in productions of this. I still think Brother Man and Sister Woman have a pretty solid plan that works out well for everybody, but they're the villains, so it is what it is. <laughs> but that's one of the things I love about this piece um, is the opportunity to explore the depth of how complex and flawed each one of these individuals are. When Tennessee Williams approached Elia Kazan in 1954, hoping he would direct the world premiere of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Kazan loved the script, but he said the third act needed to be reworked entirely. 
He wanted Big Daddy to return to the stage for the final act. He wanted Brick to shore, to show more significant growth. And significantly, he knew the audience would want to see Maggie in a more sympathetic light. And Williams hated all of these ideas, particularly the taming of Maggie. She was a hellcat from the first page, and in the original draft of the script, the script she went out as strong as she came in. Um, and he wrote to his agent saying Maggie's newfound passivity was an echo of tea and sympathy, another case of a woman giving a man back his manhood. Hmm. But then the show was a hit. And not only did he make his peace with the changes, in later interviews, he would claim he liked the ideas all, of long, all along, which was a very Tennessee Williams thing to do. Tennessee Williams was given the chance to do a rewrite in 1974 for a Broadway revival starring Elizabeth Ashley. And this rewrite blended the original and the Kazan approved versions of the third act and settled on an ambivalent tone for the play's conclusion. Um, but Tennessee kept tinkering with it. And a 1984 TV version starring Jessica Lange and Tommy Lee Jones used unpublished notes that were discovered shortly after his death in 1983. That version of the script, after 30 years and two Broadway runs and two TV adaptations and a feature film, became the text you're most likely to see published now. Mm. But there are still alternate scenes, entire monologues um, and um, B plots and C plots <laughs> that have made their way into subsequent productions and we continue to adjust the storytelling. Tennessee's plays have been living, breathing things since their inception. Mm. And they're constantly shifting and reshaping themselves in service of the characters, in service of the audience it's trying to reach. Um, and during his lifetime, in service of his own shifting perspective. Mm. And the thing I love about Tennessee Williams, and I think it, it's what makes him so uniquely Southern as a storyteller, is his relationship with his characters was an ongoing thing. When we approach the telling of the story anew, we do so with the informed perspective of everything that came before it, and also the understanding and appreciation of what it means to tell this story in this moment and that's what i love about it yeah and, and it, I, the characters were are just so personal to him but then i think as we were sort of saying earlier too they become so personal to the audience as well um in a way that like you know there are some other playwrights i think where you kind of have those connections to characters but i think the point that you make i think that's really smart is the the one sort of that that Tennessee williams has these <laughs> these continued relationships with these characters over time <laughs> I think is is a really fascinating kind of idea because you oftentimes don't think I mean you think of live theater and, and plays as something that you know it's always it's about always about the revival right the idea that the play is performed mm -hmm. you know in certain times in different contexts and like that's why Shakespeare is still performed right we, we find right. new things about it every time we perform it but I don't oftentimes think we think about that in terms of the playwright themselves right that, that the playwright too is one who's sort of evolving or growing with their characters over that pe that period of time we do have an interesting question, I think an interesting dramaturgical question that just sort of popped up here from, from Bruce and Sarah uh, that I wanted to bring in here about um, sort of that, the fact that our understanding of alcoholism has moved from moral failing to disease and we sort of have a much more nuanced way of talking about alcoholism um, in our current moment. And how has this sort of presented a challenge in our experience either sort of teaching the play or directing the play? Um, I think it's a really fascinating question. It's I think it's one of the reasons why this is one of those plays that is set in 1954 and it will always be set in 1954. I think Debbie Allen in um, even advancing the action of the play forward just by eight years mm -hmm. um, was moving more into, this is no longer a, so a social understanding 
of alcoholism. It's this family's understanding of it. And I'd still buy that in the mid 60s. Um, but it is definitely in that approach, similarly to doing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You can't present that as a contemporary play because your audience knows more about mental illness than the characters on stage do. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think in teaching it, I've had some students who I think have Certainly we can talk on one end about sort of the ways in which alcoholism kind of serves as, provides as metaphor and how the, the, the problematic nature of that in our contemporary moment. But in terms of the way that the actual addiction is presented, um, I've had mm -hmm. students who have talked about sort of the way that addiction and that idea of like the click and trying to constantly get to that level and that level kind of continuing to get further and further away was actually mm -hmm. a really useful terminology or language in terms of them thinking about their own relationships to um, to addiction. So I think, again, it's sort of, it's, it's a, it's a yes. And like, there's some parts of it that I think have a sort of translate in an interesting way to a contemporary moment that are sort of prescient that Tennessee Williams is sort of thinking about at that time. I think about sort of going back to what you were talking about in terms of like the, the couple deciding to make an alliance. It seems mm. like a modern concept that we see repeated in pop culture all over the place, you know, in sort of the contemporary moment of, you know, the, the marriage, that's not really a marriage, but more of an agreement. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a modern concept that Tennessee Williams is sort of forwardly thinking about it in this case, in this Southern family in the, you know, 50s. Right. Um, but that there's something about his way of understanding addiction that could only potentially come. And again, I'm not about psychoanalysis here in terms of Tennessee Williams, but that mm -hmm. seems to come from someone who's experienced or has been around either addiction himself or has has experienced addiction in, in the case of others around them, because it does seem that the idea of the click seems so lived in. Geneva wanted to know if you think that this play could ever be divorced from its Southern setting and still retain its essence. Hi, what Geneva. Do you think, for you, Geneva is a former student from Auburn. Oh, that's exciting. Oh. Um, do I think, no, uh, I think, I think a lot of things as a, you know, I direct occasionally as well. And I think like, like uh, I think there's a lot of plays that you could do in a lot of different places, but, um, and maybe this is just my short sight uh, coming from someone who grew up in the South, but I just don't know what other concept, like what other sort of context you could move this in that would, that, that would sort of, it just seems to me to be so dependent upon that, or the, uh, sort of an understanding of what it means to be in that environment and in that space and in that kind of mindset that, mm. I don't know. And I think, I think you've seen it too, where, where they, where there've been productions of this place, say in London, where there's been a struggle a little bit in some ways, or like in some other places that are a little bit outside of a context where you might know something about the South, where it seems like there's a bit more of like a performance of Southerness. Um, I think about this too, in terms of the mm -hmm. recent revival of The Streetcar Named Desire with Gillian Anderson, which is a fascinating watch mm -hmm. on National Theater. It's on their streaming, I think now. That is a fascinating, <laughs> like It is compelling. It really is. is. The, the stage slowly rotates the whole play. It's kind of wacky that way. But, um, but there's some really great stuff in that. But again, it sort of has this idea of people kind of playing at Southern. Um, I don't know, I, that's, that's a whole dissertation uh, there for me. <laughs> I, think it would be, I think it would be like trying to set a Neil Simon play anywhere mm. other than New York. Um, the language of the piece is so baked into its environment. Mm -hmm. um, and um, <laughs> my, uh, I, I had a very good friend who grew up in upstate New York who had never seen a Tennessee Williams play until he saw my production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and um, was um, very distracted by all the brother mans and sister womans and oh big mama. I call my sister, sister and have my entire life. And she calls me little brother. And we are from central Mississippi. Um, it is just, there, there are linguistic tics that, um, that I think by introducing the play within its own setting, introduces the audience to a world um, and invites them in. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that the script doesn't seem to follow a more typical narrative where the young person is rejected by their parents or family due to their possible sexual orientation. In fact, Big Daddy seems almost to accept homosexuality in a way that Brick can't. And both parents seem to love Brick more than Gooper. 
That's certainly true. Um, <laughs> yeah, Justice for Gooper. That is incredibly clear um, throughout the play. <laughs> Gooper and yeah, nobody loves Gooper. Um, so any thoughts on this? I mean, I, I think that's an, that's really interesting. And I think that's why I miss when I watch the film that extended scene between Big Daddy and Brick because it's such a tragic scene in which when they talk, start talking about mendacity and that idea of sort of the lies and the liars and all that stuff that come in and Big Daddy is, is saying everything. He's coming at it from every angle except to say, I am gay <laughs> and I have right. a choice to do this. But he, he can't, he comes like right up to it a number of times and then can't follow through with it. And then Brick is just like sort of not, I mean, he's picking up on it, but also not picking up on it. It's just th that scene is so well written, I think, just in terms of like the miscommunication and the way in which generationally they're just not connecting in this moment um, that it's incredibly tragic. Um, and I do think, again, it reads very modern to me. With um, with Big Daddy's own experience, he inherited the plantation from a gay couple. Right. Um, they took him in when he was just like basically a street rat kind of kid um, who shows up on the back of a supply wagon one day. And so the only functional family and the only model for a functional relationship that Big Daddy had ever seen was a gay couple um, who, when one died, the other gave up the desire to live. Mm -hmm. And that was Big Daddy's only example of love, genuine love. And he's experiencing that around 1917. Um, and I think that had a profound impact on Big Daddy. And it's the reason that Big Daddy is far more prepared for that conversation with Brick than Brick is to have it with Big Daddy. Right. Um, and Big Daddy's actually got kind of a liberal streak in some areas from lived experience. Mm -hmm. And he has perspective because of lived experience. Yeah, that is very true. Why do you think that this play, I mean, we sort of have talked a lot about sort of the general Tennessee Williams plays being ones that get produced and performed over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But what is it specifically about this play, do you think, that kind of makes it have that kind of lasting legacy? What is it about the sort of the, the way in which it tells its story or sort of what it's, what it's about that kind of make it have that kind of those roots? Um, it, I think it's the heat. Um, I think it's the, it's the pressure cooker environment that, that even jumps off the page before you ever even see it in performance. You feel the constraint of that environment. You, and it, um, it activates a sensibility in the observer mm -hmm. um, that all of the stakes are heightened. Um, everything feels, you feel like you're in the sort of environment where anything terrible could happen and probably will. Mm -hmm. And and yet he writes each character, I wouldn't say with affection. I, I don't think that's necessarily a word I would use um, to describe Tennessee Williams' writing process in general. I don't think he, he, he necessarily had affection for his characters. Um, but but he had fascination mm. with his characters and a desire to know them more deeply. Um, and and that becomes infectious. I, and I think I think we glom onto that as well. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this too. I think there's the there's there's a certain relatability, I think, to like the family weekend, like where everybody everybody's coming <laughs> to the house. Right? Um, <laughs> have experiences hopefully that are not quite as dramatic as this one but i also think too about it always reminds me i think about sort of the empathy that's sort of on display or that that, that the potential for empathy Good for the audience in a play like this because you see on the surface of this right if you look at like who this family is where they live what they're sort of on the outskirts like how the society would view them it's a very specific almost a stereotype of, a, of the way a certain sort of southern life is lived, right? Mm -hmm. The family with the inheritance and all the sons and all that stuff. But once you go inside the house 
and really get in with those characters, you see the kind of complexities that are at work there and develop over the course of the play a sense of empathy and, and, it's, a, and it's competing empathy. So you find yeah. yourself not necessarily going through and just in support of one character. Right. You may have like tendencies to support like Maggie for a while, but then you're like, she did what? Now my tendencies have gone over to this, but you know, they, and it shifts. So I think mm -hmm. it, it's in that way, it's sort of, uh, I guess for lack of a better way of phrasing it, emotionally kind of instructive in a way too. You, you, you learn and you sort of are, are pushed and pulled internally by watching something like this to kind of go outside potentially some comfort zones that you might have in terms of sympathizing or empathizing with people that are sort of outside of your potential, um, like who you might feel comfortable with, I think. And it sort of yeah. brought, it pulls you there. And um, his craftsmanship in what my director friend Adam Copeland calls the audience pleasures. Um, his craftsmanship in just don't bore them. And when you, I mean, it's that same impulse that makes the Real Housewives franchise real popular is you know that when you're coming to a Tennessee Williams show, things are going to get messy. Pregnancy, um, terminal illness, it's all going to come out. Boom, right? <laughs> Firecrackers, screaming, no-neck monsters, everywhere you turn. And, and that the controlled chaos can be as exciting as watching a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Because um, right. I am here for the explosions, you know. And if you look at the trailers of all of the film versions from the fifties and sixties, they they are. I mean, the trailers themselves that were cut yeah. to advertise the movies are like a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. I mean, these are like yeah. what's going to be discovered, and I mean, there it speaks to that that structure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Topher Chase. Thank you for for being with us tonight, folks uh, across the country watching. Thank you so much. Guys, I, I can't thank you so much. This was just, this was a fantastic hour of hot Tennessee Williams. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Have a great night. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.